I just want to say um, I've really enjoyed my time here, um, mostly because everybody in the crowd here seems to love beekeeping as much as I do. And at home, nobody wants to talk about bees. Like, I, <laughs> I, I get, into, like, get into five minutes of conversation, their eyes are glazing over. And, but here, everybody wants to talk about bees, and they just want to keep on talking about bees. And, that's, and I really like that. Um, but uh, what I want to do is, uh, I just want to say, I, I've been to a lot of conventions, and <clears throat> uh, there hasn't been a single time I've been to a convention, I open up the agenda and I say, oh, Ian Stepler's going to be here, I'm going to go watch him. I've never, ever done that. It's just, uh, <laughs> it's just we're just a sideshow up in the front here, and we just spur on conversation. And the real gold is in the audience, that's what I always believe. And, and when you go down, sit at the tables and talk to guys, you really get a good, diverse... Uh, uh, perspective and view on on everything about beekeeping and I just like the conversation um, so that's what I kind of wanted to bring <coughs> into this uh, talk just a little bit uh, just what you guys are coming to me after the show is asking about all these side questions and all these just these management things that I do and when I'm going through be, feel free to uh, yell out some feedback or some questions uh, sometimes I go through a little quickly but I'll just I just want to show you kind of what I how, how I do things but <clears throat> beekeeping is really interesting. I love talking to beekeepers because everybody has their own, uh, everybody understands bees differently for one thing. And then there's so many other influences on the bees uh, it, within their area. So they got to manage them a little bit differently and everybody has different philosophies. And, and then like my farm, I have one brother who manages risk. He has no risk tolerance. And then the other one is, can handle all the risk in the world. And, and I'm the president of a farm trying to balance that. It's impossible, but it's the same thing when we're uh, managing uh, bees. If we had all the money in the world, then uh, we would all have the fancy extractor and this fancy boom arm and we'd have all brand new boxes and their bees, you know. So money is a big consideration when we uh, look at how we set up our, our beekeeping operation. And I just love talking to beekeepers and just seeing how they navigate their way through all these issues and how they set up their, their systems and their programs because I'm all about setting up systems to manage workload and stuff. Uh, so money, money is a big factor here. So when I talk to beekeepers, it's usually, <clears throat> you can always tell talking to a beekeeper on how much they hate something by how much energy or time they put towards uh, trying to avoid doing that thing. <laughs> So for me, I hate lifting. Uh, my father has a very bad back. When he was 21, he slipped a disc, and he's always had a bad back. So he's, uh, his focus in life has always been trying to do things less physical. He's been forced to. He doesn't want to see us injuring ourselves. So he's always said, if you're going to get into this business, Ian, he said, if you're going to get into the business, let's invest in it now when you're young, and let's, uh, let's not wait until after you bugger your back up before we buy this lifting arm. So I invest into lifting capacity, uh, extraction capacity, because our, like I was talking yesterday, our honey flows are so short and the canola whips us for granulation, so we have to get our work done. So I make sure uh, we can get our honey extracted and wintering, and wintering can be a bitch in our area. And just by, um, I'll show you how I winter inside a little bit just to help control my environment and my conditions, just to help get the bees through a little bit uh, easier. So lifting honey, so the, uh, it's the curse. You lift a box of honey. This year we're lifting honey off our hives and they're stacked like this, some of those hives, and they're 80 pounds, 80 pound boxes. And that's, you can, you can buy a skid steer and you can palletize everything and manage your, your hive movement this way, but I do my thinking in the shower after work, after I'm tired. I stand in the shower, I'm standing in the hot water, I'm thinking, how in the heck am I going to get how am I going to solve this problem of lifting the boxes off the hive? I can't get a skidster to do that. Like, how am I going to, what am I going to do? How, how am I going to solve this problem? Because my back is sore. We had a really honey, heavy honey pull back in 2010, uh, 2009. Um, so what I've done is I've uh, adopted this uh, easy loader. Uh, uh, I bought this easy loader and I've adopted the, uh, the escape board uh, trick. And this isn't anything new. I've adopted I've Back home, uh, there's quite a few of us that pull honey this way. <clears throat> so I've kind of uh, gleaned wisdom off other beekeepers in the area, and I kind of tweaked it to my own operation. But uh, So I use this easy loader, and by I'm going to show you how the escape board works, and my whole, I'm going to step you through the, 
the honey pool, but this is the answer I found. This lifts all the boxes. I didn't lift a single box, this whole entire honey pool. We, uh, I forget how many boxes we put through. It's 225,000 pounds of honey, and I didn't lift a single box. So it has uh, uh, saved me a lot. Um, it comes from Australia. I'm, uh, I'm not a spokesperson for these guys. This is just, this is just what I use. So um, um, it's an easy loader 300, lifts three, uh, 300 kilograms, which is about 650 pounds. And um, the nice thing about it is when I have kids coming to want to help me work on the farm, I have all types. I have the big ox, which is beekeeper's best friend, and then I have the slighter, smaller uh, kids that want the job, can do the work just as effectively, just not physically as capable. So uh, this machine helps with that. So I can hire anybody that comes onto the farm and has a bit of work ethic. Um, so, you know, <laughs> these guys, uh, this is my work ethic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so these guys are a bunch of clowns sometimes, but you, we keep their yards fresh. And uh, it's an articulating boom, and what it is is just basically a fold-up arm for transport, and then it just kind of swings out like this, so then we can carry that cradle anywhere we want in the yard. And, it, uh, and uh, yeah, so it is very easy to maneuver. I just love this machine. Self-leveling, I'm in the hills. A lot of my yards are in the hills, so the truck sometimes is on an angle like this. So then you press a button, and it levels out the arm. It's really convenient. Uh, and these are my workers, yeah. Yeah, they are kids from school. <laughs> um, so what, uh, it has an attachment on the, uh, the cradle. The cradle is uh, a, a radio controlled, uh, it's got a little toggle switch on it, and it's, uh, there's no wires to the, it's electric over hydraulic. So it's very basic design, and it's got a, a radio control on the, on the cradle. So if you want up, you go this way, if you want down, you go that way. Um, and uh, these two arms click into it on the side, and there's little flaps. Uh, it, it's mechanically, it's, it, when you, you click into the, the box, it kind of it clicks down, and we lift up, then it clicks into the handheld box. So we don't have to modify the boxes at all because it, it kind of it, it, uh, clicks into the box itself. So what we do <coughs> when we're uh, pulling honey, um, so what we're doing here is we need to get the bees out of the box, right? Because we don't want to bring bees back to the honey house. And we want to do this in a way that we don't have to break apart every box because I want to be able to use this machine to lift all the boxes and then bring them all back bee free. So without having to handle every box at a time, uh, we, we use this arm. We lift off this box, the, the stack of boxes. They're 80 pounds each. So there's quite a few, uh, like there's 240 pounds of, of, of honey weight in here. Um, lift it up off the hive. These are full of bees yet. This guy comes here. We have a truckload of empty boxes. He slips two empty boxes on top of the brood nest there. There's a queen excluder there, right? So these are empties now, and we put the, ex the, the bee escape on top. Right. Uh, when I say empties, I mean empties with comb that have no honey in it. So it's an empty, bo uh, empty uh, boxes with comb. So uh, we call them uh, empties, yeah. Uh, yes, we, we run nine frames, uh, and then we, we space them very crudely just with our fingers. Uh, uh, we spend a, a little bit of time on that, but not too much. We, we're going, so we're trying to get through 250 boxes or hives in a, in a day, so the guys put it down, and they just use your fingers. And if it looks symmetrical by the eye when you put the box down, usually we shake it like that, and that kind of lines everything up, and it's nice and quick, and we just kind of fuss a little bit if we have to. Um, so we put these uh, bee escapes down, and then we put the supers back on top. <clears throat> okay, and what we're doing is in a beehive, the bees are naturally moving in the if you understand how bees work in a beehive, they're always going up and they're always going down. They're making a continuous loop. And whether or not they're coming down to touch your queen or why they're going down, I'm not sure. But they're going around like this. And what I'm doing with this bee escape is when they go down, they can go down freely, but they can't get back up through the cones. For some reason, they can't navigate through the cones. So what I'm doing is I'm, all these bees, as they naturally go down, they can't get back up. They don't know different. These are empties now. They just keep on working. Meanwhile, all these boxes are being emptied full of, from bees. So very effectively, in about three days, uh, we're, when we run into weather constraints, we'll push it. We'll go about two days. There'll be a few bees in there. But three days pretty much get all the bees out of those boxes. 
Um, that's a good question. When I am, uh, the question was, uh, when I'm pulling honey, am I concerned about empty boxes, not completely full of honey when we're pulling? <clears throat> and when I'm uh, setting up my honey yard to extract, like I, I sit and I point at the calendar, say we're going to start on this day. I set my apiary up that next week to have enough space in that hive to satisfy what the bees need within a certain time. So I'm trying to use the, my boxes the most efficiently as I can. So I'm not going to waste two boxes on a hive that's not going to fill two boxes. So I try to predict what's going to happen. And I, I, I put my boxes on at that time. <clears throat> and if they don't happen to use it, it just mixes into the bunch, right? So what we do, we pay no attention. Once we start, we are so focused on just trying to get through all these hives before uh, the flow is over to turn those boxes over. Because what we're trying to do is we're, if when those bees fill those boxes up and when you put empty boxes back down there, they fill them up almost instantly. So you can almost like, it's, it's magic to your eyes. So if you can hit that flow, you hit your timing properly, you strip the boxes, you put them on, they fill them right back up again. And you just hope that flow continues right on to the end of that second. So then you get an excellent honey harvest. If your timing's off a little bit, then you know, you're, you're pulling in more empty boxes. But uh, we try not to bring empty boxes in if we can. And if there's a little bit unripe, ripe honey there, there's always really cured honey underneath and it all mixes together. So the bees, when they, they'll go through, this is uh, Murray Lewis uh, from Austin, Manitoba. He's my box builder. He, he, this is, I get these boxes from him and they're just fantastic woodenware. And he's, he's, he's one of the guys that got me onto this uh, escape project. But uh, <clears throat> so he makes these escapes for me. They're, they're called conical. And he's got a nifty little cone that he, he owns the injection mold and he makes these uh, cones. But the bees come down, they hit the screen, and they in, almost instantly go down into this groove here. And then when they hit this groove, they don't climb back up. They kind of go in circles until they hit these holes. And they just like single file filing through all these little uh, escape uh, uh, cones and they can't get back up. The reason why I use screens is because in our area it gets kind of cold later in the season and I like that heat from the hive going up, keeping, trying to keep the honey warm up top so we don't get as bad a granulation uh, later in the season. If we have, we do have some September pulls when we have late canola, that's when we have granulation issues. So I try to keep the heat flow going up, that's why I have the screen. I know a lot of guys that have this as solid board, so this screen is just my preference. But um, yeah, so yeah, he'd make up two designs. He figured this is a better way, putting it this way. I found it made absolutely no difference. But uh, that holds the bees down. That's my daughter. She, uh, she has a cell phone now, and we make her pay for her, uh, her monthly <laughs> bill. <laughs> and so she, she's, she was late on one month, so I said, well, you could work for me for two days and pay it off, and there she is. So she's out. I'm pulling honey here. These boxes are empties. Okay. And it's just happened to be raining today, but um, these are, these are empties. Uh, no bees in these boxes, full of honey. <clears throat> and I'm taken with the cradle and, and I'm putting them onto my truck. So there again, I'm not lifting these boxes. I'm just managing the weight with the, with the arm. She's following behind. Uh, and we're adding a, th a third honey super on here and then we're capping them off. So we're still in the middle of the honey flow here and, and we're, ready, um, we're ready to get more honey in. How many boxes do you typically go through in your flow? Like on a, on a regular, I see four, but you're putting another three on there, so that's seven. That's seven. Is that yeah. normal? Uh, yes, yeah. <clears throat> and if the flow continues on, then we just keep adding boxes. But uh, depends on how heavy the flow is, if whether this, amount of boxes carries on right to the second end of the second pull or not sometimes you run out of honey and then we're pulling in empty boxes at the end so it just all depends on how much honey is actually coming in so just on a mental calculation you're running through seven honey boxes yeah and let's say there's average of 55 pounds a box pounds. yeah 70 80 pounds a yeah so yeah And uh, re remember, I average all my averages, so you'll have some hives that aren't going to produce as much. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how beekeepers factor their uh, averages because some guys add their nukes into the number, some don't. I, I do it every hive as a unit, so I have my nukes that are producing honey, not as much, so I add them into my averages anyways. But, so 200 pounds a hive is uh, 
is a good number for us around average, yeah. But this last season, I was 165. We're just a little bit lower than that, but you know what I mean. Yes, yeah, that's what I use, yeah. And it blows in the wind, it's a pain in the ass. But the bees will kind of, when we put that lid on, they'll just instantly seal that up. So it helps with, uh, when I'm putting these escapes on, one of the problems is if you don't have bee, through the first pull, when you have lots of flowers out, those bees think nothing about the yellow. And they're out there and they're flying. They don't care about the honey on top. But once the flow starts to wane a little bit, they're going to find cracks and they're going to go in and take that honey back, right? So we, we got to make sure that there's no cracks to, so those bees don't go back in and put the honey underneath because I want to take it. Um, so that's one of the strategies I use is to help seal the top. Uh, that it, you know, and, and I've, I haven't had a lid yet where it doesn't have a crack in there. And I do a few other things. I'll, I won't get into that. Yeah, it's a pain in the butt. So, um, the uh, so I also because I have the easy loader, I have um, these. I have everything set up in two uh, hive pallets, and the reason why I do that is so I can also move my bees with this easy loader. It just makes things very convenient. I'm not dragging a forklift around behind me, and I can pretty much instantly just decide, oh, I'm going to move these hives. So I just open up lift up the uh, easy loader and just I have tongs on another attachment forks right and then I can lift up so I can move these guys these guys are moving out to alfalfa they're going they're coming off canola and moving them down to Miami down around some alfalfa seed fields so lift them up put them on the truck away I go I have on the same entrances um, the reason being and you'll see um, I winter inside and I stack in fours, so I have to have those entrances facing the, uh, the aisles. So that's the reason why I do that. So the rain, you got the three nose and two hundred something on either side. Would that be about the maximum that arm can lift? Um, yeah. Sorry. That gets. Yeah, that gets. I've moved hives right after I pulled them, and they equal four boxes total, but. And, and there's one time I moved them, and. I got back in two days and they had filled the bloody hives up already. So I'm, I'm lifting these hives and I'm thinking that arm's probably at max capacity right now. <laughs> and I can feel the weight as I go. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so anyways, yeah, this thing works really well for me. Um, I, it doesn't work very well when you're moving bees at night and it's hot and humid and the bees are bearding out the front because you're right there. <laughs> and if you know anything about moving bees at night, they crawl and they, they, they sting you. So then the guy... When I'm complaining on Facebook about it, the guy with the, the forklift says, oh, well, why don't you get a forklift? <laughs> <laughs> I could do that, but I like to, uh, yeah, I, that would make more sense. <laughs> but, but also when you're doing it, there's always a little bit of, you know how bees crawl at night. You can't get away from them. Yeah. So here we, we, we've had the bees inside my winter shed. This was two years ago. Uh, end of February, we had this warm spell come through and uh, it was getting up it was like five or six days of plus 15 and I couldn't hold the bees in the shed anymore it's too early to put them out I knew it was too early but the warm weather is coming I had to put them out because they're they might as well have been flying outside than inside my shed so I put them out and they enjoyed the 15 degree weather for a week and then cold weather set back in <clears throat> so you know there's there's plus and minuses of everything that we do and how we manage um, if I were just managing my bees outside, it wouldn't have mattered because then they would have been in wraps already. I manage my bees inside so nothing's wrapped up or, and they're, they're ex totally exposed to the cold. So the cold came back and I'm looking at three weeks ahead of minus 20. So that's not going to do the bees any good. So then, so Carrie and I got busy. We like to work. She's, um, she's here. She's sweeping the snow off. So the system has moved back in the cold weather. These hives have been moved out. They've enjoyed some flight. Now we're moving them back in. Um, so move them out, move them back in, you know. But I think by the end of it, there's guys that moved their hives out at that time who didn't have any refrigeration. But they left them out because they said, what the hell? And I, their hives started to dwindle on them just because, well, there's a lot going on in a, a springtime colony. If once, once these hives want to start brood rearing, you leave them outside in the cold, uh, you, it you know, so I put them back in and they're able to at least stay away from that minus 20 weather. And I think that brood nest they initiated uh, actually uh, 
Uh, I think I did them some good. So I have everything on pallets, and that is very nice. I know beekeepers back home um, that still manage with trolleys, and I don't know how they do it because this is so easy. You put bees on a pallet with those little U-clips or W-clips, and you don't have to strap your hives or anything, and you just put them down. You lift them with forklifts, and you move them around in trucks. So I do. I have this forklift. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's nice to have hives on pallets just for the very reason that the forklifts can lift these hives up. I stack them six high in the winter shed. Uh, so it, it, we're just stacking bees. It, it's, uh, Sorry to diverge here for a second. Just go back to that last slide if you wouldn't mind. Your, your hive configuration was a side-by-side -side two step, a two-way. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so there's a two-way pallet here and a two-way pallet there, just facing opposite directions. They're kind of balancing on. Um, as four-ways, they, they handle a lot better than two-ways. When you're stacking two-ways up six high, if you stack them up, as, like, like guys who migrate with their bees, they would never use two-way pallets just because it would be so teetery on these semis, right? So four-ways would be a lot better. I considered maybe attaching the two-ways together to make more stability, but I... I'm, I, I haul 10 miles each direction, so it, and I bring them in on a cement pad and a forklift, so I find no trouble with that. They, your easy loader do Yeah, your max weight is, I know a guy who does lift four-way pallets, and he's got this great big cradle thing that lifts a pallet up with this thing, but he needs two guys to push this thing around. There's a lot of weight, you know, you got to consider. So I, I've, I'm very happy just to... Yeah, and it's a lot better than uh, single pallets too, because I'm when unless some guys will move their hives on the single pallets, but then you're <clears throat> with this you're cutting your work by two. Yeah, you're going two at a time instead of one at a time. You know what I mean? So, so that's what I do. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I do my nukes too on little pallets like this. Just you know, I have it, so I got it set up, and I made little pallets like that, and uh, so, so I just go to town with them, and then. Uh, I I try to do as little lifting as I possibly can. So when I'm uh, in my yards, like uh, right here, we're slashing down this yard. I don't know who, who was in the other lecture listening to me, but I just showed them uh, making up nukes here. We're just slashing down a yard. So we set out all these empty boxes, like these empty nuke boxes, whoop, and, uh, and we just simply fill them up. And when they're full, we just use the arm and put them on the truck. So it just saves a lot of back work. And the same as talking yesterday about my splits. Uh, I do the same with my splits. I just strip the boxes off here. So the only time I'm lifting these boxes is from here to there. And then every other time that those hives are moved is with that arm. So it just saves a, a whole lot of work. Uh, so I can't say enough about this arm. Um, I know beekeepers who, uh, um, who adopted this practice from the old style beekeeping love it. And then I know another guy that has bought it and tried adopting my style honey pole, and he, he went back to the old style because it wasn't quite quick enough for him. He's, he's actually, I know two guys that way because he figured, oh, why don't you just hire another two or three guys and just use fume boards is quicker? And he's right. Just uh, so his, his criteria isn't on the same level as mine. He doesn't hate lifting boxes as much as I do. <laughs> so, so that's what there's a question here. Uh, Spring. Oh, yeah, these are, I get my metal shop, my local metal shop to make these uh, galvanized steel U-clips, uh, I call them. And you just slip the, uh, I used to strap my boxes down to the pallet, and that's, <clears throat> that's unnecessary work. So I, I've, so I adopted this from other beekeepers, and they just make these little U-clips, and then these hives fit down into them. And the box, the clips hold the boxes together, so it, in a sense, holds himself onto the pallet by friction, right? And I've never had a, uh, except a rotten box, but I've never had hives slip off because of that. The big downfall about them is the bloody ants will get into this, and, or carpenter ants, and get in between and make, they think that's a pretty good home for them. So they will, the older boxes, like these new boxes, uh, they won't touch but, because they're dipped in wax. But these, these ones they love because it's soft wood for them. So that's one disadvantage. Guys use W clips where so there's more of a space. You don't have as much... Uh, rain rot and such like that. Yep. Is that a double bottom board? Or they just tight fit together? 
Um, so like the configuration here? That's one piece of wood right across. It's exactly the same way as the migratory beekeepers use as four-way pallets, as, uh, except I, I chopped mine in half. Yeah. So it's very, this is, uh, this is the way that you palletize your bees because it's two by fours and, and three quarter inch plywood. And you can, I dip mine in wax and it, it's, uh, it is very good for forklift work. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's all I know, actually. <clears throat> yeah. But I will tell you, uh, we, there's, there's beekeepers that love to take pictures and love to work without gloves. I always wear gloves because I hate getting stung. <laughs> uh, and I always wear a face veil. I, I wear a jacket, but... Yeah. Yeah, I don't know mean bees, really. But you, have, you run into mean hives every once in a while. But uh, it's uh, it's no fun being around a, an angry hive. Yeah, we we work all conditions. Like we're working every day with these bees. So uh, you have the sunny weather beekeeper, and then you have the work all the time beekeeper. So we're going out like that picture with my daughter there. It's drizzly rainy, and we're still pulling honey. Uh, the bees weren't so cord cordial at that time. They're they're a little more, you know, how bees get. <laughs> yeah. So so we suit up. I always wear gloves. I always say a baseball player wears a baseball mitt and a cow farmer wears, wears mitts and a beekeeper wears bee gloves. <laughs> so that's just what I do. Anyways, uh, so the other uh, focus on my farm is extraction capacity. And um, it's taken a long time to get to this point. I've been through a lot of equipment. Uh, I started from the bottom and I worked my way up to it and it's very expensive. Um, and you just got to be able to justify your costs, right? It's all about, it's a number game. Um, so I've, I've settled into a, uh, a 60 frame cow and extractor. I bought this back in um, uh, 2005, I think it was, brand new. Uh, my old extractor, I was, up, I was getting up over five or 600, 700 hives, and my old extractor just wasn't keeping up to the, I wasn't getting ex the honey extracted quick enough. It was granulating on me, and I wasn't getting my boxes back out quick enough to be able to get them to fill it up again. So, so the farm uh, at that time, we weren't a company at that time, but we made a decision to uh, invest into extraction capacity. So this machine <clears throat> uh, will put uh, about 275 boxes through in a day, like a seven-hour work day. Um, uh, three to four-man crew, I like to keep my honey house well manned. Uh, I always hire a little bit more than I need because sometimes kids, they don't plan very well and they have appointments they want to go to. So I, I said, okay, just go. We have enough at home here to keep things going. Um, and this will, we're, last year we we're doing 22 barrels, 18 to 22 barrels a day. So that's pretty much what my capacity is here. And in the honey house too, I'm also running Every, I, like all the honey boxes are on pallets and then we bring them in on the forklift and we have this nifty little arm, pneumatic arm thing comes and lifts these boxes. So they lift them off the pallet onto here because you're lifting uh, 75 or 80 uh, pound boxes all day, it gets tired. So you, we use this and put it onto the conveyor here. The guys scrape the, the tops and, and uh, goes over to my uh, uncapper. Yeah, and uh, and the guys will will just kind of shift that stack of boxes over a little bit, and they'll click this arm in, and as they're lifting it, you got to crack that box still, and that's that's a huge chore cracking boxes, but they get good at it. I mean, you lift it up just a little bit, and then you just put your pry bar in there, pop, it'll pop and break all that burr comb over. So it's you know the guys get used to how to work that machine pretty quick. It's uh, that arm is just kind of like a, a sweeping motion. Yeah, this here has, um, <clears throat> so you have two arms coming like this and there's just a little bit of play in the top plate here. So just enough to get that, that the, the, this handle part, just enough to get it into the uh, 
the hand holds there, and when it lifts up, it just automatically presses in as it lifts. So where the two daggles come up, that's a hinge? Yeah, that's a hinge, and it's just loosely, and when it lifts, it just naturally grabs it. So it's kind of a slick little deal. Did those arm manufacturers? Yeah, I come from California. Um, I can't remember the name. Uh, my employees called it my can-and arm. <laughs> but it originally came with a, uh, a frame grabber. It picked uh, nine frames. Maybe some of you are, are familiar with it. You pick nine frames, you click it in, and it'll pull the nine frames out and put it in the uncapper for me. And that worked really well, except for the... I noticed my uh, my smaller uh, uh, type employees weren't as capable of of reaching up and in and mo making this thing work properly. So I bought this um, box pusher, and you just slide the box into here, and it pushes the frames out and out of the box. And this is really slick, a deboxer, yeah. So it slides down my little conveyor here, put it in here, and then you, they just press a pedal like this. And the air ram comes, pushes those frames straight up. So there's no more reaching and grabbing or trying to lift or anything. There's just everything's done for them like that. It's so nice. Um, I would recommend this to anybody. Uh, also, my old honey house, my old, my old uh, extracting systems, we had that cursed honey sump in the floor. And I hated that thing with a passion. Um, you have a hole in the floor and you're trying to keep the honey house clean. You can never keep that damn sump clean. There's always a, it's, it's terrible. Uh, when you have any time that you have a honey sump or settling tanks, you're always skimming. And probably my worst job on the farm is skimming tanks. I hate skimming wax. Hate it. So what I did is I brought in this Cooks and Beals uh, wax separator. And how it works, first off, you're all familiar with how an uncapper works, like a frame. It, uh, so, so these frames, so this is a, my uncapper. The frames go in, and I, I don't have a picture for it. I should have put a picture in. But in here, it sends uh, frames individually through two knives, heated knives that re reciprocate like that. And as the frames get pushed down, it peels the wax off, right? That's how we get the wax off the frames. Uh, there's honey in that wax, and I want to keep that wax, or that honey. So what I do, <clears throat> and because I don't want a hole in the floor, I don't want that sump in the floor, these guys sold me this unit. So all the wax that comes off the frames drops into this mixing tub, okay? So it takes the wax off the frames, drops it down. From the extractor, there's an auger here. So the auger augers the honey from, it's all stainless steel, augers the extracted honey back into this mixing tub. So, and it, I built a paddle that mixes in like this. So it takes all the honey from the extracted frames, all the honey and wax that comes off the frames being cut. And we mix it up into a nice even consistency. And that is pumped through my, um, my solids pump up through a heat exchanger. I don't have a picture of the heat exchanger either, but it goes up and we heat it to about 90 deg degrees just to, uh, just to warm them up a bit. And I didn't get a good picture of my wax separator, but it drops it into my Cooks and Beals wax separator. So this drum, this, I could only find this picture. This, I'm cleaning this, this, this uh, separator out, and I was just showing off to one of my beekeepers this little lift I made here. So we don't have to actually physically lift the damn thing out anymore. So I made this little lift off an of auger winch, and we're lifting this drum out. So this drum actually runs inside this... Uh, inside here and spins at 420 uh, RPM. The honey is dropped into the top of this thing and it works, uh, it's like a, it's a centrifuge, just like a cream separator. This drum is spinning around and that honey drops in there and inside that drum, the, uh, the honey and the wax gets pushed to the wall. And what happens is that honey forms a layer of honey and the wax actually, believe it or not, starts floating inside that spinning drum. And as we add more honey and wax uh, mixture to it, it'll drop down into that and that wax accumulation will actually start building inside that spinning drum. So then you have pure, because of densities, you have pure honey on the outside and as that column fills up, it goes through a baffle, these baffles here, and it gets spit out to the side. And then you have an accumulating layer of wax on the inside, it just keeps building like this and we maintain about an inch and a half wax inside. And beside it is a little spinning knife that goes like this. So a continual process where the, uh, the, the honey is added, uh, the clean honey is tapped out, 
and the wax, pure wax and other debris are shaved off inside uh, with that knife. And it, what happens is it, is it gives me pure honey and then it gives me uh, pure wax like this, dry. It's not completely dry, but it's, it's as good as I want it. It's pretty much like uh, wood shavings. So that goes out the bottom and that goes straight into our, our rendering tank for, for the wax. Um, I, I just love this machine. And it's eliminated all wax skimming. I, that's why I like it so much, because I hated that job so much. I tried pawning it off to my workers, and they hated it so much they wouldn't do it. <laughs> so when I, had it, I was stuck with it. Um, and then uh, everything is the, the, the wax, or the honey itself, uh, density, uh, the density of honey goes, it goes out. And then the wax layer, that spinning knife inside will peel off that wax layer as it builds, and it drops it straight down. And it takes the bee legs and everything else with it. So the, the wax and the bee legs and little bits of wood or whatever is in there all accumulates with the, uh, with the, uh, the wax layer because the densities are, are such. So from the spinner, we tap it off into my, uh, my milk tank. My neighbor, this tank's like 50 years old. My, my neighbor is a dairy farmer. And he polished this damn thing for 20 years after he was done with dairy farming. So he finally sold it to me, and he's really happy it's being used. I fill this thing up probably twice a, a day. And uh, my grandpa, he's not around anywhere. He's passed away a couple years ago, but he's, he was 96 here in this picture, and he's tapping off barrels for me. So he felt uh, he just loved the honey pool because he, he felt useful. He, he, I used to spill honey sometimes because you get filling a barrel. You look this way, and it's spilling. <laughs> so... So, Grandpa, he didn't spill any barrels. Okay, so that's my uh, honey host in a glimpse. Um, my other strategy is wintering. <clears throat> and I know lots of guys who winter outside. Uh, I still, I winter outside in singles and doubles and all that. Um, I hated it. I hated wrapping up hives this time of year and unwrapping hives because all the mouse piss. And every once in a while, you open up a a hive pack and there's a skunk looking at you. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, you know, the rodents I couldn't keep out. I've tried poisoning them. So I said, heck with this. And I'm, I'm kind of a kind of guy that likes to control my environment. So uh, this isn't new. This has been in our area for quite a long time. I've just adopted this practice. And it's pretty basic. I'm going to uh, walk you through it. But um, I bring my hives inside and they, I keep them out of that minus 30 windshield weather. Uh, lots of snow and cold in our area. And one thing about us and why this suits Manitoba so well is because when winter sets, and it sounds like winter's going to hit us and when I get back on uh, Wednesday, but as soon as it sets down, it doesn't leave us until March. So we're, once we get cold, we stay cold through the whole winter, it seems. Uh, I keep it at 4 degrees Celsius, and that seems to be a magic number. Um, some guys, I know guys that they're talking eight, but I think that's too warm. They figure about four degrees there is most efficient for uh, food consumption. Do you have refrigeration in that? Or a lot of guys, I just use airflow. Refrigeration, I get quoted like over $50,000 to put a refrigeration unit into it, which would buy me a little bit of, uh, I won't, wouldn't have as sleepless nights sometimes in the spring when it gets warm and I can't move them out. Um, so there's guys adopting that practice uh, back home. Yeah, well, you need a you need a refrigeration unit. Like they they talk uh, for every 140 hives, they talk a ton. So if you're talking 1,500 hives, uh, you gotta and then you gotta stage it. You got your initial stage, and you gotta you gotta get your secondary stage so it cycles properly, so you don't get you don't get freezing up and and all that kind of stuff. Cut a reaper off the front of the tree. I considered that, but it can't keep up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyways, that's, you know, that's, that's what makes this business so interesting because there is ideas like that. And these guys are adopting these practices and they're tweaking out all the bugs. And then by the time they get it figured out, maybe I'll adopt that practice too. Yeah, and that's just it. And if we had all the money in the world, then I would have already had one. <laughs> so anyways, uh, so this time of year, when I get back from here on, on not Monday, but Tuesday, <clears throat> we get back and I'm going to start picking my hives up like this. Uh, from my bee yards, and I'm going to bring them, stack them on my truck, bring them in, and I'm going to stack them up um, in rows. Like this, I stack mine six high. Um, and when I fill the shed up, <clears throat> I turn the lights off, 
And there, there is a question yesterday, do I screen my entrances on my beehives? And I don't. And the reason why I don't have to, well, first off, if you're moving bees, you shouldn't be screening your beehive entrances. Um, you'll notice as soon as you screen off your entrance, those bees get really agitated and they want out. But if you just leave it open, <laughs> they go back in their hives. It's much easier to move your bees when they're inside their hives. And they'll be inside their hives in the evening, so you'll catch most of them anyways, right? So don't screen your entrances because if they get really hot, they got to get outside. And if you don't allow them to vacate their hive, if their hive's overheating inside, everything's going to die. So you got to make sure you watch what you do. So I keep my entrances open. Um, and I turn the lights off. It's pitch black. If I have a little, I, I go through my shed after I, on Monday, I'm going to get it all set up. I'm going to block out the windows. And I'm going to turn the lights off and I stand there for 15 minutes. I'm going to look for any rays. My guys run into my, with a the forklift, they run into my overhead door. So I have to fix that. So I got to, I got to fix the uh, weather stripping on the outsides. And any ray of light, it seems, it comes February, they see that ray of light and that's where they're going. They're flying towards that ray of light. So it's got to be pitch black. They don't see red light as well, so I'll have red lights in there to do my work. But if I have a little lamp on my head, white light, and I'm doing my sweeping, they'll come right at my face. But if I have a little red light on top, they don't seem to see that as well. So uh, it's just the spectrum of light, I guess. So the, this is my old forklift. But um, I'm moving these guys in. I'm showing this picture because I'm showing my, my ventilation uh, fans. I have one fan. I might be a little under capacity on my fan, but I have one. This one is a smaller and it's a 12 inch fan. It's set an idle on a, um, uh, like a, like a controller, temperature controller. So when the temperature goes up, it ramps this, the fan speed up. In the dead of winter, when my temperature is static, uh, it slows right down to an idle speed. And I'm always exchanging air, trying to get the moisture and the uh, carbon dioxide out of the, uh, the building. Do you have any floor vents? Uh, no, I'll show you what I do. <clears throat> um, and heat. We're always trying to remove heat. Wintering bees inside is a totally opposite strategy from wintering bees outside. Outside, you're trying to keep them warm, keep them protected. Inside, we're trying to cool them down all the time. We're trying to remove that heat. They say about 15 watts per hive. So you have 1,200 hives in there, and that's like 15 or 18,000 watt heater going all the time. So you got to remove that heat to ma maintain that temperature. Yes, it's insulated outside on top, and then I have uh, two-inch foam underneath the uh, the cement slab. <coughs> yeah, and I find I have the ability to add heat to the building if I need to, if I if it gets cold. But I've never in my life since I started wintering beans inside. I've never a ever added heat to a wintering shed. I'm always pulling heat out. Those little buggers, they produce a lot of heat. So we're always cooling. And it's well sealed. Yeah, so that's a really important factor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so my shed uh, capacity is like uh, 1,200 or 1,500 hives can fit into this. And I'm pushing my square cubic footage is... 15 to 20 cubic feet per hive is what you want. So I'm, I'm getting pretty tight to capacity. If I'm going to winter any more bees, I'm going to have to consider another wintering shed. So my air inflows are just two ductings. Uh, light, traps, light traps are important. I have this exactly on the other side. So the light has to make, so there's like two turns, one turn, two turns. So that doesn't let any light in and non-restrictive uh, ventilation shaft. So this is a two foot by two foot and two foot by two foot there. So that just lets as much air as those fans are pulling out. I found an interesting uh, deal. Uh, I had light baffles in here too, which restricted my airflow. And I was in my office in the, in the building, in that same building, but just beside the wintering shed. And my bees, you know, my fans, it was warm and the fans were on high and, and the bees were ag ag um, agitated. And I'm in my office and I'm agitated and my teeth are hurting and I'm trying to figure out what? Is it just I'm doing the book work? <laughs> or what's going on here? So I went in here and I took out the baffles in here and uh, allowed a freer flow of air through the building. And I think what I was doing is I was restricting the airflow so there's a, like a real negative pressure inside that building and it aggravated the bees and it aggravated my teeth. So as soon as I did that, 
the bees went back in the box and my teeth were happy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's just a, you know, little things like that that you learn as you go through. No, but I'm looking more into that and more and more beekeepers are. Uh, nobody really knows what that magic number is. So we're all going on whatever the, the level CO2 is in a typical building. I think bees can tolerate a little more CO2. I think they're more comfortable in a higher carbon dioxide environment. No, no, I don't. But that's the next step. I'm <clears throat> there's guys all over the place trying to, with all the technology we're getting, especially with these smartphones, we can get these apps and these little sensors and it's becoming more affordable now. So, so if my bees are inside, or if they're inside right now, I know I'm here in Kelowna, if I had those and I could just look up and see what's going on in that shed and not have to worry about them, right? And if something was going on, it, an alarm would ring. That's what I want to have happen. Yeah, because it's, Exactly, because when, when we have power outages or something like that, it's pretty critical. We keep that airflow going through. Um, no, but we have it so we can, we have, do have a farm generator on the farm and we could, uh, the electrician has allowed us to figure a way to back feed it into the system if we had to. Yes. Yeah. It's exactly the same deal. You got to make sure all those, if you're going to maintain conditions, you got to make sure they're maintained. Otherwise you have trouble. Yeah, and I'm seeing some of these great big sheds down in the States and it looks really neat. And these guys are putting a lot of attention into these buildings. They're, they're putting tens of thousands of bees into these, some of these wintering buildings down there, down in Idaho or, or somewhere. But, um, and they have all the bells and whistles just to make sure, because if there's a failure and all of a sudden something goes wrong, they're gonna lose that whole bloody shed of bees in there. So they gotta make sure everything is, you know, in line. So there's always risk to this kind of stuff when you're con controlling conditions. Uh, and uh, to your point, um, uh, layering of air is really, it's, it's terrible. So you, you gotta, we, I spend a lot of attention towards making sure the air doesn't layer carbon, uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and, and such. So I have 10 ceiling fans in this building and I don't allow the air to layer anywhere, any pockets anywhere in the shed. I don't get too elaborate. I just have like um, on the ceiling, there'd just be 10 fans all the way around. So then when you, I have a candle and I walk around to every corner <coughs> with these fans going and you just see a little flicker. So that's what I use. Uh, uh, sensors would help me in that case too. No, I just have them blasting, all blasting down is what I do. Yeah. Yeah, it must be circulating within that fan space on itself. But there is no, I'm not finding any layering or um, I light a, a match and the smoke kind of disperses nicely up into the air. So I'm getting good mixing. Um, <clears throat> there's guys from Quebec walk into the shed and, and they say, you got this place too windy. You gotta, all you gotta do is just mix the air, make sure there's no layering. Cause you, there's um, insulating uh, air around a cluster. There's that air shield around, you, you don't want it. If you can, if you can manage, without disturbing that air shield around that cluster, then the cluster is, is going to maintain their carbon, carbon dioxide and humidity and everything, all that good stuff within that cluster easier. So he said, you're blowing too much air, you're interfering with what the bees are trying to do. And he's right. But when the bees get really active in spring, they start bearding out because they're getting too warm and they want to fly. So I turn those fans on full, just like it's windy. And when a little bit of windy helps disperse the heat and it helps push the bees back into the, into the hives. So. But it's very important. It's worked very well for me. I'm all about simplicity. And there's guys that have ducting and all this stuff, and that's great. But this works really well. So, yeah, so these bees are stacked up six high. And when they're outside, the bees will die um, naturally, and they just fly away. So you never see them. But inside, they fly into the aisle. Into the aisle and they accumulate on the floor. Uh, all through the winter, you'll see this is natural. There's nothing unnatural about it. It's just the summer bees dying off. Uh, they can't make it through the winter and they just, and, and sick bees too. You'll find a hive that's sick with something and you'll just see a big blast of bees on the floor because they're dying. So they li typically leave the nest as they're dying off, which is nature, their way. And so they land on the floor and I, uh, I sweep the floor once a month push broom. I have a mask on because it's very dusty in these sheds sometimes and push the bees into the pile and take a little wheelbarrow and I have my little red light so I can see what I'm doing and I 
find these bees and put it in. And I hate sweeping up dead bees because those bees are now dead. <laughs> They're not wintering anymore. Uh, these guys uh, notice, they notice I'm here and they're kind of coming out to see me and saying hi. And um, I'll do this, I'll try to do it once a month just to try to uh, monitor my drop. I used to keep it on a spreadsheet and trying to figure out, oh, we have this much drop this month and it had a bad drop in March and correlate it to my conditions of the hives coming out, but none of it made any sense. It didn't mean my, my, uh, my winter drop meant nothing to how my hives went out of winter. So, so I don't keep track of that anymore. Um, Yes, I take them out to the field. It makes great fertilizer. Yeah. So, yeah, we sweep them up. I have a mask on to make sure we don't get sick because the old beekeepers uh, would sweep without, before we had any sense in our head, we would sweep without masks on, and they actually found little bits of bee legs and wings in their lungs. So it's not good for them. It's like the old saying, farmer's lung. It's the same kind of principle. Uh, so I'm very careful that way. I like to sweep the sheds up just so we don't get a musty smell in the shed, just to kind of keep things fresh because dead bees kind of get stale after a while. So I take them outside and I dump them into my tractor and I, and I take it out to the fields and dump it on the fields. And so we have barrel fulls. So I'll have like 10 barrels of bees at the end of the winter that we sweep out. It gets really dry in uh, the Manitoba winter. It gets cold and you're pulling cold, dry air into the building and it's hot, or not hot, but it's warm and, and humid inside. And, and then you're expelling that and you're just sucking all the moisture out of that shed. Uh, so I run into some, when it gets really cold for prolonged periods in winter, <clears throat> the uh, relative humidity will be like 10%, 15% inside. And that's, and the bees handle it. Like I'm, I'm always looking at the, uh, I, I'll go up to the top and I'll pop some lids and look at the, my little foam thing there. And I'll look to see if there's condensation on, on that little foam, just enough. If there's condensation on there, then they're good. Then they can access that water droplet and go down and dissolve some of the granulated canola honey if they have to. But if there's not, and if they're drying out, I'll walk through with my uh, pressure washer and just lightly, is the key, lightly mist the aisles just to bring the humidity back up in that shed for a little while. And the fans aren't running very fast because it's cold, so I can kind of maintain a higher uh, humidity level this way. So it's kind of a crude way of doing it, but that's what I do. Uh, we've got to be careful not over drenching these hives because uh, it's a good way of transferring nosema <laughs> if, as, as it drips down the hives. So we have to just lightly mist the hives just to bring the humidity up. So I'll do that through the middle of winter when I have nothing to do. And come spring, these bees, uh, it's, it's probably because they've been inside for such a long time. Uh, since November, we take them out in March. So in March, I figured any idiot can winter inside up to February, but it's the month of March that gets us. So it just seems like March is just a little bit too long. So that's why we focus so much attention on nutrition and disease control is because that month of March gets these hives inside. They, they just get, they're ready to fly. They're ready to, to go and void themselves. They're ready to take on the, the world, but we got to wait until the, uh, um, until winter actually finishes and spring comes because we, we're not going to do them any good setting them out in cold weather because they can't properly bring that, rejuvenate that nest. So we, we always like setting our hives out when spring comes so then we can kind of move forward into uh, building those hives. So we hold them as long as we can inside until spring actually comes. These guys get really anxious. Uh, so when you have mild days like 10 degrees, Fans are on full blast and you're just trying to maintain that temperature, keep them inside. We have the fans going. These guys are bearding and it's not killing them. That's, they're just going outside. We'll get a little higher drops in these days because the bees, uh, they just fly out a little bit easier. But they'll come out, they'll beard. It's kind of neat to see. Um, and then when it gets really bad, we open up the shed doors. I don't know if you know many beekeepers on the prairies, but whenever we start doing this, everybody's kind of like, hey, I'm opening my doors. So... This is what we do. We open the doors and just get at night and just get that uh, airflow through. Just get that heat outside. And, this, and with all the snow here and the cold, it drives the bees back in the boxes. And it seems to work really well. So I have a, a door on this side of the shed and I have a door on the opposite side of the shed. So when I open both doors, it just, just pulls the air through the shed. So it cools them down really well. Five, Five. okay. Uh, that's uh, that's we uh, we we always argue about that. 
Um, I say no, because when I pull them out of the winter shed, well, according to Randy's, uh, uh, your graft there, it, it shows that they are brooding through the winter. Very small patches, I think it is. Because when I pull them out, uh, and I'm pulling these frames out, I'm not finding hardly any, but just scattered, like a shotgun pattern, pattern or food. When I set them out, like the next few days, she's, she's going to town. Very little brood is what I find. One problem with indoor wintering is uh, nosema causes concern. Uh, nosema apis is, this is what happens. This is, the hive just kind of blows out. They, they can't hold on anymore. It's so like they're, like when you have a gut problem that you can't hold on anymore. So they just blow out. So I hate seeing these, but I haven't been seeing as much as this lately. I'm not sure it's if it's because I'm not feeding corn syrup anymore because I'm feeding sucrose or it's because the species of nosema has changed. I'm not sure what's going on. But, uh, but that's what that looks like. And uh, yeah, so we put them out on the forklift. I move them out at night because then the bees, uh, they see light. And we open the doors at light, everybody's flying. So what I try to do is move them out at night. So I open up the doors, move them on the trucks into my bee yards at night on the frost usually too, so I'm not getting <laughs> stuck. Um, Helps the bees just kind of settle in while they uh, while I set them down, and when the sun comes the next morning, they're not as agitated. Um, red lights, they can't see the red light. Uh, yeah, and then first flight. This is this is last year. I was confined into one spot because of the fro there's no frost. I couldn't get into my other spring yard, so I found this gravel ridge, like this old gravel pit, and I, there's about five or ten acres. I put all 1,500 hives down. And it wasn't probably the best thing, but it's what I had to do. So I had lines and lines of bees. So I'm, I'm walking through this yard and it's just crazy amount of bees flying. Uh, I didn't have too much drift issues. I went back and looked in and everybody seemed to find their way back. And, and uh, yeah, so this is what my first flight spring day, they're out, they're flying, they're avoiding themselves. And it's just quite the amazing, I, this is one of my favorite times of year, just walking through an apiary that's been in the first or second day of flight is if, if you're ever around a beekeeper putting bees out in the spring, I'd recommend go and, and, uh, and check that out because it's quite the amazing thing. But anyways, that's, uh, so that's my little, that's what I wanted to say. Um, so you're probably wanting me to compare indoor and outdoor wintering. No, I'm just wondering, when you put 1,500 uh, or 1,200 hives in there, what percentage do you expect is going to come out of the setup? Uh, there's a lot of factors tied to that, and it's not, uh, indoor wintering doesn't solve disease issues, and it doesn't solve uh, malnutrition or poor queens or anything like that, but what indoor wintering does for me is it just helps me manage my conditions I can put the hive in and I know I put them in I, I kind of know what's going to go on through that winter and Manitoba gets bloody cold and windy and you sometimes you get snow drifts and they're covering your bees and some suffocate and just a whole bunch of conditions we can't control the, the hive does a very good job managing our our weather but this is predictable this this is they go in and I'm, I'm typically looking um, you know a few years ago um, uh, probably because of mite issues uh, and virus, uh, 30%. But for the last little while, we've been around 10 or 15%, and that's what I expect. 5% is nice. Yeah. Um, if you went outside, uh, when do you queen start uh, laying inside the pyramid in all labor? Not very much. But if you wintered outside, when would they start? January, February? Uh, I would, the guys are telling me end of February they're usually starting. Yeah, they're getting a head start, and the guys are usually, when they get mild periods, they go and start putting protein on to their hives and just starting to boost them. And uh, they're, some of them are starting the treatment side early, even. I you uh, Depends how you, well, I don't know. Um, are they actually seeing any benefit or not? I'm not sure, because it's, it, you start brooding a hive up into February, <clears throat> and our area gets really cold in March sometimes, so they have this little brood nest going, and all of a sudden it gets cold. Their, their tap on resources is, is extreme. So my, my philosophy is the only thing that I concern about my, my concern myself through winter is just getting him into spring. 
don't worry about trying to stimulate them in winter. Don't try to any, just get them through winter because what's going to make or break that colony is your queen quality usually and the growth in May. Like I'm seeing tremendous growth in May anyway, so why would we start in February? <laughs> so that's just the way I see it anyways. Uh, I see most, when I've started making my nukes and wintering my nukes, uh, is nearly 100% survival on my nukes. And that's probably because I'm spending just a little more time assessing those nukes because I'm doing more queen work with them off the start. So I know it's a young queen. I know it's going like this. I know it's going forward. With those other singles, I'm more so uh, approaching and I'm looking at external factors when I'm doing my fall assessments. Instead of going down, I check my flags. I always check my flags, but I go through and I look for other factors. So I'm looking over, so I see this, so this high is probably good, this high is probably good, this high. So I'm looking at other influences around it to see what's going on. And sometimes I misread, so you know, drone layer will go in. Um, I'm getting pretty good at it though, so. <laughs> so I'm not putting too many hives into winter that shouldn't be going into winter, yeah. So uh, thanks, thank you for my for your attention. Yeah. <laughs>